Next, we have up Dr. Peter Cullis, who is one of the recipients of this year's Canada Gardner International Award for his pioneering work on developing lipid nanoparticle drug delivery systems used in the COVID mRNA vaccines, the foundational technologies for the highly effective COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Cullis is professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of British Columbia, and I am delighted to turn it over to Dr. Cullis. <clears throat> okay, I, I'm going to give a bit of a retrospective. You'll notice my voice is not that great, but I have been tested for COVID-19 and I'm negative. So, you know, this is, <laughs> that was a great relief, by the way. Um, it's coming all this way and not being allowed to, 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 to speak would have been a problem. Okay, I, the, um, <clears throat> what I want to uh, do today is really indicate to you that um, where you, you, you might see science as a linear pathway, um, it's not. Uh, the, um, you know, we, we go through various uh, iterations and then things happen uh, that are, uh, you can only call it serendipity or good luck, and uh, so I'm going to emphasize some of those aspects here. I'm also going to <coughs> excuse me, emphasize the, um, the length of time sometimes it takes. You know, this is uh, literally 50 years of lipids for me. So, um, okay, I have a number of conflicts of interest that are indicated there. Uh, the, um, so I'll go back to the beginning. Um, this was a long time ago, 1972. Uh, I got a PhD in physics um, <clears throat> using magnetic resonance. Uh, the, um, you know, it seemed to me that the, uh, the, the most interesting um, problems were well outside the field of physics. Uh, the, uh, so I, I got to, I mean, simply because I was an experimentalist, and if I did experiments and I showed something was different from established theory, it was very likely my experiment was wrong. Um, so I, I got interested in the life sciences and was awarded by uh, some um, you know, miracle, actually, that uh, I was awarded an MRC at that time. Uh, a postdoc fellowship to go to biochemistry department at Oxford. I knew absolutely nothing about biochemistry. I didn't know what DNA was, didn't know what a protein was, et cetera. So when I got, I got to Oxford, the, um, I helped build an NMR machine. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the lab there, they just moved from another lab. They had a big magnet, uh, but they didn't have the electronics to go with the magnet for the NMR machine. So actually, my physics background came in pretty handy as they had to build this thing. Um, so me and a graduate student uh, put it together. And so it was uh, <clears throat> then they say, OK, well, what, are you gonna, what was I going to do, uh, do, do with this apparatus? So the, uh, <clears throat> what, what we decided to do was to use the NMR machine to study uh, lipids in biological membranes, and this is something that uh, once I started on, I've never stopped. So it's, here you're seeing a picture of a uh, of a biological membrane on the left hand side. Uh, it's completely dependent on the lipid bilayer. <laughs> I'm being exaggerating, of course, but uh, the um, very often we get uh, you know we we, we 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 take the view that the proteins. Oh, thank you. I'm sure I'm going to need that at some point. Um, that, uh, that, that uh, proteins do, do everything they do. They, they do all the work in biology. But lipid bilayers are pretty darn important. Um, so all biological memories, of course, have a lipid bilayer. And the, uh, <coughs> they really, the, 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 the membrane lipids are, uh, are, are really quite amazing, and the amazing properties of um, self-assembly is due to their amphipathic, as it's termed, structure, a polar head group, and, and the hydrophobic acyl chain. So what I spent really, uh, and I still, I'm still, still doing it, uh, 50 years looking at was, well, gee, um, you know, biological memories, they have hundreds of different species of lipids. Well, why are they all there? And what are they doing? And some of them, if you put them in water, you extract them, put them in water, they don't adopt a bilayer structure, they'll adopt something completely different. Uh, so, uh, so what roles are the, do these non-bilayer lipids have? Uh, similarly, they have asymmetric transpilar distributions of lipids. The lipid composition on one side of a membrane is different than the lipid composition on the other side. And so, ask the question, well, can we generate lipid asymmetry in response to some of the ion gradients you find across membranes? And what are the consequences of getting different, uh, <coughs> different uh, lipid distributions? There's huge consequences, actually, but I'm not going to be able to go to that today. The, uh, <coughs> so. 
what we discovered was we could use the NMR machine to study lipid polymorphism or the different structures of, uh, of lipids. Just take lipids, add water, and then they'll adopt various structures, say a bilayer phase, and the, uh, there, uh, the, uh, we're looking at the ph uh, phospholipids. They have a phosphorus in the head group, and uh, they can rotate rapidly around their long axis. That gives rise to a characteristic line shape uh, that we could then say, okay, the low field shoulder, high field peak, that was a bilayer line shape. And you know, we could say, okay, then they have a cylindrical shape, if you want to think of it that way. This, these concepts might not seem to have much to do with the vaccines, but actually they turned out to be quite useful. Uh, then other structures, such as the hexagonal phase, long tubes of water surrounded by lipid head groups. You get uh, emotional averaging around those long tubes. And the uh, a low field peak, high field shoulder, that's diagnostic of the hexagonal phase. And a different, uh, a different molecular shape can be uh, assigned to that. And so this was, this was a, uh, it could give us a great insight actually into, uh, you know, we could put a whole intact membrane in there, see the bilayer structure, et cetera. But in order to pull out what each role of what, 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 what lipids are doing, you can't look at the intact membrane, it's just too complicated. And so we developed very simple uh, model membrane systems, so little vesicles. Uh, <clears throat> we had to develop a machine to do this, um, to, this is called the extruder. Uh, but uh, where we rammed bigger, bigger bilayer structures through small polycarbonate, uh, 100 nanometer polycarbonate filters, and out the other end we get these unilamellar systems. This actually did kind of revolutionize things in terms of being able uh, to study uh, well-defined well -defined systems. Now, the, uh, we then showed, we used these, these liposomes to, uh, to show that it, what are these non-bilayer lipids there for? Well, if we put them in these bilayer structures, we suddenly found, well, they, they fused. They would fuse to form larger structures. So that's one of the reasons that is that, I mean, membrane fusion is kind of important, fertilization, interstellar transport, and all of that. And so you start to see a rationale or a reason why uh, these other components are actually there. Um, <clears throat> We also used these uh, liposomes to demonstrate lipid asymmetry. Uh, so we, in order to do this, we, 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 we constructed uh, these small vesicles have a pH gradient. And we said, okay, well, what can we flip across the membrane uh, to, to, uh, to simulate lipid asymmetry? In other words, more lipid or particular lipids on one side versus the other. And uh, we synthesized, and I, this is a, let's talk about serendipity, but I'll, I'll say later. Uh, the, uh, we synthesized this ionizable cationic lipid, which has the property uh, that can exist in a protonated form, or a, um, or an, I'm going to emphasize this one, I don't know if this actually works, but no, it doesn't actually. Um, but anyway, the, uh, <coughs> it has a property that, say, at low pH, is protonated and positively charged. Uh, whereas at higher pH, uh, the is deprotonated and net neutral. Well, the net neutral form can flip across the membrane very easily. But if it's protonated and positively charged, lipid bilayers are remarkable. They're highly impermeable to charged uh, molecules. And so it gets to the inside, get protonated in the low, in the low pH environments, but the acidity of a lemon, and uh, stay there because it possibly couldn't get back out again. And so that was, that was a, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, did all sorts of things with that, which again, I'm not going to get into, but we got distracted. Uh, by the drug delivery uh, potential. <clears throat> what we found was we could load cancer drugs uh, into, these, into these vesicles and to very high levels. This just shows pictures of, uh, of these vesicles uh, with doxorubicin inside. So <clears throat> the, we could get so much doxorubicin in there that it was past the solubility product and it crystallized out. So we have little nano crystals of the uh, doxorubicin on the inside. And so these, of course, make, well, this is a pretty good drug delivery system, and we're still working on this, actually. We got two drugs approved by the FDA and the EMA, and we're still working on ways to improve them further. I'm, I'm sure these are going to be really quite important in the fight against cancer. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so we started a company that was back in uh, 1992 uh, to, uh, to use these liposomes to deliver uh, uh, cancer drugs to tumors. Um, so this is me and four postdocs in the lab. We had a good time with this company, but uh, the yeah, raising money in companies is kind of an imperative. Um, and the CEO came to me one day and said, 
I, uh, putting old drugs in liposomes, this doesn't work. Uh, we've got to be doing gene therapy. So I said, OK. Uh, <clears throat> um, and we're, we, we started off on that route. And so since then, we've spent uh, about 27 years uh, trying to develop systems uh, to um, deliver SR and mRNA. So I'm going to go through three, three parts of this. Uh, the, first of all, the design of lipid now. How, how do we encapsulate you know, these negatively charged polymers uh, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these nanoparticle systems? Uh, the uh, on Patro story, uh, to, to, this is the first demonstration that these things could be actually useful for delivering uh, RNA. And then I'll say, I'll, talk, I'll close very briefly on the, uh, on the vaccine story. Um, so our aim in 1995 uh, was to develop a delivery system to take a small interfering RNA, 13 uh, kilodaltons, you know, pretty big molecule in drug terms, um, to uh, silence a, a gene in the, uh, in the liver. Now, th this involves packaging it up in a lipid nanoparticle, and then we inject intravenously. It has to circulate around, uh, go to the liver, which is where we were aiming to silence a gene. Uh, extravasate, get taken up by hepatocytes, we hope, uh, and get out of the endosome and actually do something. This is kind of a major challenge, should we say. Uh, and of course, the immune system is set up to avoid this happening at all costs. Uh, so the, uh, this, is, this is occasionally you start off on things where you, you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, the, uh, the first problem that we hit was that uh, how do we encapsulate these nucleic acid polymers? The, uh, they're obviously very negatively charged. Well, the only way to get them into a, efficiently get them into a lipid nanoparticle is to have positively charged lipids. Well, nature doesn't like positively charged lipids. There's no, no uh, positively charged lipids in nature. They're really, really toxic. You want to kill a mice? This is a good way to do it. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, well, how, how are we going to be able to use uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, <coughs> these lipids? How are we going to encapsulate? Well, this is where basic research comes in. You know, so what we did was we tried DODAP, this lipid that we'd made uh, <coughs> to investigate lipid asymmetry. It had this property that low pH is protonated, positively charged. Well, you can flip across bilayers, but you know, maybe it could, we could also use it uh, to encapsulate a nucleic acid. So in other words, we at pH 4, as I said, the acidity of a lemon, uh, maybe we could formulate it at that pH where it's positively charged, and perhaps things with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, mRNA or sRNA, or in this case, sRNA, uh, would remain encapsulated. And we found it worked really well. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, we could, we could uh, incubate our RNA, DNA, what we want to encapsulate in water at pH, it was buffered at pH 4, and then have the lipid in a ethanol solution to mix it together very rapidly. And one of the first things to fall out of the solution is the, would be the oligo with uh, the, the positive charged lipid, the ionized lipid associated with it, do it rapidly enough, and the other components would then form what we term a limit size vesicle. And so it turned out to be a very useful a very, uh, and relatively non-toxic, I mean, that which was, of course, the primary thing. Uh, way of encapsulating uh, nucleic, nucleic acid uh, polymers. So ideally encapsulating 100% uh, um, trapping efficiencies. Uh, we can adjust the size by changing the surface lipid to core lipid ratio, scalable, reproducible. I should say we did this before we really went into animal experiments because we knew we couldn't use the uh, cationic lipids. So now I'll move into the, uh, <coughs> the first application uh, which was, uh, is the Ompatra story. It's just to, to, uh, to treat a drug that's already been, or treat a disease that's already been mentioned called transthyretin induced amyloidosis. And so <clears throat> this really, uh, this is a protein that's made in the liver. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the, that, that, that situation, that uh, <clears throat> progression. So after a conference I attended, this was in uh, 2004 in London, uh, I, I put here, I was pursued by, I was pursued. Uh, the, the, the Victor, I mean, I often characterize him as a mad Russian. He has those characteristics. So somewhere in Soho, uh, where uh, we, uh, we ended up, uh, he was saying, well, we have a delivery problem. Um, 
how do we get our small interfering RNA into hepatocytes in vivo? Because alnylam was founded solely to use small interfering RNA as a therapeutic to silence particular genes in whatever tissue to inhibit the production of pathological proteins. So they had a problem. They had to, they, 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 this resulted in a collaboration with uh, alnylam uh, that went on between 2005 and 2012 that involved um, INEX and, uh, and my, my lab as well as, as well as Alnylam. We had uh, teams in both places and uh, we, we synthesized we, many different formulations over those years. The, um, we started with a question uh, that, I mean, are these things any good? Uh, the, um, we, can form, we can get them into a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, they, aren't that, they aren't too toxic, but uh, do they do anything? Uh, with the ionizable lipid there. Well, lipid nanoparticles get into cells by endocytosis, has already been mentioned, and uh, we want to design them so if they, uh, if they, they basically deliver the contents to the cytoplasm as opposed to the lysosome. Uh, so the, uh, this is, uh, we need to destabilize the endosome is the bottom line on this. Well, how do we do that? Well, this is again where basic research turned out to be useful because what we found was that if we, <coughs> the anionic lipids or negatively charged lipids that you find in biological membranes, if we had a positively charged lipid to that, it flips it straight over to these non bilayer phases. In other words, it become very, uh, <coughs> very destabilizing for membranes. And so this, this gave us a kind of design approach uh, to uh, go after the ionized lipids, that at some point they had become positively charged and then uh, interact, uh, destabilize the endosomal membrane. So that's the way, that, this was the design feature uh, that we followed during this, uh, um, well, we're still following it today, but during that uh, collaboration with Alnylam for sure. Uh, <clears throat> so in, engendering the maximized potential for formation of non bilayer structures when they become positively charged. Now we, we assessed the, um, the in vivo potency of these systems uh, using a factor seven model. So this factor seven is made in hepatocytes and, um, and obviously goes into the circuit clotting protein. Um, so if, we si if, if, if we're able to silence factor seven, uh, then um, say 24 hours later, there's less factor seven in the circulation. So it was a reasonably high throughput uh, model to test our systems, uh, test the efficacy of the systems. Now, many different ionizable lipids were uh, formulated, uh, but what we found was that the, <clears throat> the potency was enormously dependent on the pKa, in other words, the pH at which uh, these lipids got protonated as the pH in the endosome goes down. As the endosome matures, it goes from pH 7.4 down to about five or, or, le or less. And so, uh, the, um, you know, the, 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 obviously these things are sensitive to that, to that environment. Now this was an amazing result actually. We found that the potency uh, was, <coughs> was uh, re I say, remarkably on the pKa. This is a log plot that you're seeing here uh, of the potency went over the effective dose where we see a biological effect. And uh, if you moved as little as uh, say 0.5 units away from the an optimum pKa of about 6.4, uh, the efficacy is, <clears throat> was reduced by a hundredfold or more. So very, very highly dependent. And over the course of the collaboration, uh, we went from about 10 mg per kg, uh, where we could see some effects of gene silencing down to five micrograms without increasing the toxicity. And so this is where the therapeutic index of 1,000 came from. So, okay, well, <clears throat> this is where the uh, uh, the <coughs> clinicians at Alnatum said, okay, well, I think we got something that's ready for the clinic. Uh, what uh, we should we go after? And uh, the, they chose to go after um, transthyretin-induced amyloidosis. This is a remarkable statement here, actually. I mean, because we can silence factor seven, <coughs> that means we can silence any gene uh, in hepatocytes. So just with the same form, you switch, you, you go use a different sRNA, and then you can go after a different a different disorder. It's, it, one of the charms, it's an amazing, uh, these genetic approaches are, are so powerful uh, because they're so general. Uh, anyway, HATTR amyloidosis, uh, so transthyretin is a tetrameric protein. Uh, the, um, if, it's, if there's mutations, it can form these fibrils, uh, which presumably deposit everywhere in the body. 
um, they have really nasty effects on nervous tissue and cardiac tissue. And so uh, heart failure, et cetera. <clears throat> the about 50,000 patients worldwide, um, and uh, it's, uh, there's no effective therapy, usually f five, uh, <clears throat> fatal within five years. Uh, this picture has yeah, already been shown. It's, it's a uh, really nasty disorder when you think about it, because if you have trouble, walk in, uh, trouble walking in your 30s uh, you, and you're, you, know, <clears throat> you have this disorder, you're very likely to know a parents, grandparents, uncle, whatever, because it's hereditary disorder. You'll know what you're in for. Um, so this is uh, not a pleasant prospect. So a, simple, a potentially very simple solution here, uh, just silence that gene. Uh, let's stop that protein being made. And so this is the, designing an sRNA uh, to, uh, to silence transthyretin, and then you're going to reduce the levels of transthyretin in the blood. Uh, maybe if you get very lucky, uh, you'll um, get some regression as the amyloid fibrils uh, are dissolved. So uh, really, a, a potential symbol. This is the design of, of these medicines. Uh, is, is much simpler than small molecules, that's for sure. So the phase three study was performed by Al Nyla. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so this was done, and the, res the results were um, announced in 2017. 148 people with the, uh, <clears throat> administered the uh, the transthyretin um, drug, the uh, sRNA that's a silence transthyretin, um, or sterile saline as a placebo. Primary endpoint was a, um, the neural impairment score uh, <clears throat> in over an 18 month period. Uh, secondary endpoints, the quality of self reported quality of life, ability to walk, body mass, and it's obviously a wasting disorder, et cetera. Now this is where, the, 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 over this 18 months, what was found, if the, the individuals on the placebo, uh, the neuro impairment score got steadily worse. Uh, so they were, they were not doing well. But remarkably, uh, the people uh, in which we were silencing that, the gene in the liver, they, if anything, they got better. Um, now this is people that are already established and uh, you know, uh, progressing hereditary disorder, and here, here we are uh, actually impacting that in a fundamental way. This is the best clinical trial results I've ever seen. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, they were announced in 2017. Uh, I always characterize the p-value for the improvement, uh, the neural impairment score endpoint uh, as, uh, as being, well, there's no the one, this is one over Avogadro's number. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that this drug works. And um, the, uh, similarly, uh, for uh, the other endpoints, quality of life, ability to walk, and so on. So potential, really a curative therapy for what was a previously a fatal disease. That's kind of remarkable. I thought this was the high point in my career, um, as you can imagine. Um, anyway, more was to follow. Uh, so this, this was approved, this drug was approved in, uh, in 2018 by the FDA, and it's been approved in many other jurisdictions. Uh, a pretty big deal, uh, clinical validation of the lipid nanoparticle approach, uh, but um, <clears throat> it also dramatically demonstrates the power of these gene therapies. So I'm going to go on now for the last, uh, the last few minutes uh, just to describe what happened with regard to the uh, vaccine um, <clears throat> application. The, uh, in 2012, when uh, on Patra went into the clinic, uh, the, um, the, uh, I mean, as a as scientist, you can't change, you're not going to change a formulation once something is in the clinic, you know, the, 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 otherwise you've got to start all over again. So what were we going to do? And, uh, <laughs> So I said, okay, we're, we're delivering 13 kilodalton and sRNA, maybe we can deliver a messenger RNA, and maybe we can get that to express a protein in the liver, as opposed to silencing a protein, maybe we can get hepatocytes to make a, a protein that, uh, that uh, we want to, uh, we want to um, express. So this is, kind of, you know, I mean, we have a thousand copies of sRNA in a lipid nanoparticle, uh, with a, say, 2,000 base, base uh, mRNA, maybe we have two or three copies, you know, where it's that much bigger. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so we wanted to find out whether this was possible, and it, it turned out to be remarkably possible. Um, 
And so the, uh, really uh, what, we were, what we found uh, is that uh, these systems can be, we can use the liver as a bioreactor to produce um, any protein. This is a heck of a statement. Um, child is born lacking a certain protein, well, gee, let's get their liver to make it. You know, your liver makes 70% of the proteins in your body. Seems like adding a few more, it's only too happy to do it. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a revolutionary uh, approach when you think about it. Uh, this is in pigs. If you, uh, the, if you want to win the Tour de France, we've got a solution for you. Uh, expression of uh, erythropoietin um, super physiological levels. So the, uh, <laughs> the um, but you know, this is where serendipity came in again. Uh, the, um, we were approached in 2014 by Drew and Katie. Um, the, the needed a delivery system for uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, and uh, as you've heard, uh, how they were, they, they, they managed to beat some very fundamental problems in terms of the ingenuity of these systems and the levels of expression, but they still had a delivery problem. They still had to be able to get uh, these big molecules into target cells to get uh, the kind of responses uh, that you've, you've already heard about here, MEC1, MEC2, et cetera, uh, in antigen presenting cells and muscle cells. And as you've also heard, uh, the, uh, <coughs> this, this was uh, paper of the year uh, in uh, 2017. Anyway, the Zika virus vaccine, really quite remarkable. Now, all we're doing here, we, we, uh, as, you, as you saw, we had the erythropoietin or marker protein or whatever we were expressing in the liver. Uh, all that was done here is take pretty much that same system and, uh, <coughs> and then uh, encapsulate a messenger RNA that coded for the pre the Zika virus pre-membrane and envelope glycoprotein. And uh, so the, uh, <coughs> this was then injected intradermally uh, and then the, in mice and then uh, challenge, you know, the two weeks, 20 weeks later and uh, complete protection against infection uh, by the Zika virus. So this is, this is a, uh, <coughs> as you've, again, as you've already heard, but pretty, pretty amazing uh, that uh, you could just take these systems. We were optimizing for the liver, uh, but boy, suddenly they started to work as vaccines. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> so you gotta get lucky in life. And this, this was uh, definitely, <laughs> some other things have happened, so this, this made up for a lot. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Anyway, so in, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2018 or, or so, Acuitas, this was a company we co-founded, uh, <coughs> began working, this is on the basis of the Zika virus and other, uh, other results, began working with BioNTech uh, to develop um, influenza vaccines. And um, BioNTech was also working with Pfizer um, on a flu vaccine. So, uh, <coughs> Obviously, in January, February 2020, all efforts, you know, went into uh, making a COVID-19 vaccine for obvious reasons. And so here it's just, a, again, a matter of swapping out uh, the, uh, the mRNA for an mRNA coding for the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. And you all know the, uh, <coughs> the results here, uh, that uh, in uh, November of 2020, uh, the, um, the, the, the press release, I remember reading this press release, I couldn't quite believe it, 95% uh, effective for preventing uh, COVID-19 and um, across all age and gender, race, et cetera, uh, <clears throat> reasonably well tolerated. At the bottom you'll see they were anticipating perhaps making a 1.3 billion, it's a big number, uh, doses by the end, I think they're closer to 3 billion by the time it actually uh, finished. So approved by the, <clears throat> uh, the, the FDA and other, many other regulatory agencies and has played a major role in, uh, in containing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's been a pretty amazing journey. Um, and what I hope I pointed out uh, is that a lot of that depended on you know, very basic research uh, and having the tools and the insight that that gave us uh, to be able to design, you know, these lipid nanoparticle systems for, um, for, for that, that had application as vaccines. The, um, it's also been pointed out particularly by Drew, uh, the journey is just beginning. Uh, this is really, I always term it the third generation of pharmaceuticals, first generation small molecule drugs, second generation biologics. 
uh, but the, the uh, gene therapies, proliferating replacement uh, vaccines, gene editing, uh, it's just opened up a tremendous variety of new potential therapeutics. And you're going to see these really becoming fairly dominant uh, over the next, uh, the, I think, within five to ten years, we're going to see uh, people are projecting as many as 40 percent of new drugs are going to be uh, based in this approach. The, the charm, one of the amazing things is how quickly, and it's already been pointed out, but you know, if you, once you know the protein you want to silence or express or edit, uh, then you can, identify, you can make the sRNA, mRNA, et cetera, within a matter of a month or two, encapsulated in a day, and you've got this highly targeted uh, personal therapeutic, uh, personalized therapeutic available. So we're going to see many, many uh, new drugs, as I mentioned. I've got to close by acknowledging this is the work of hundreds, if not thousands, of people that I've really talked about here. But one of the things that we've done in, in Vancouver is keep a team together. That team, the, the, the group that I, I showed that where we formed INEX Pharmaceuticals, we still work together um, 40 years later. Yeah, so like Mick Hope, Tom Madden, and many others, Steve Ansel, Ying Tam, Barb Mui, and Paul Olin, I think mean, 20 years or more. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, Al Nylum team, as is indicated here, had a huge influence. Mark Tracy at Kinnick Kink and Martin Mayer, Manu Manamaharan. Marcus Cifellini in UBC Chemistry Department was the guy that really broke the problem of the ionized lipids, where we just said, how do we get things that are more toxic or less toxic? Turned out well, he made one that was not just less toxic, but also uh, more efficacious. These things work in their brain, but I haven't talked about that. Uh, my own group, and of course, Drew at the uh, University of Pennsylvania has played a huge role here. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. <clears throat>